Our next speaker is Steve Minnis. Steve is a graduate of Benedictine College. He received his Juris Doctorate as an attorney from Washburn University, an MBA from Baker University. I think you run out of degrees after a while, but you know he brings a, a wealth of knowledge. He was a corporate attorney for a while. But I have to say, what he has done at Benedictine, if you're not aware, you need to check out Benedictine. Even if you don't have kids going to, to college, uh, just the atmosphere and what he has brought as in his leadership is just unbelievable. You know, education has to be one of the most attacked, right, attacked issues within our culture today. I head up a political action group and we work all the time on trying to find candidates who will support Catholic social teaching and just good stewardship of our resources and things in our culture, but education is under serious attack. So it's really good to know that you have someone like Steve Minnis, who's the president of Benedictine College and everything that they've done. But he's absolutely revolutionized the college up there. Steve is also a patriarch. He's a father of three grown children and a grandfather of five, and he is expecting another one any day. So with that, please welcome Steve Minnis. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm making sure, oh, it does work. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, <clears throat> they, when they asked me to speak, I said, okay, uh, just as long as I don't follow, uh, follow Scott Hahn, they said, oh, don't worry, he's speaking in the afternoon, right? <laughs> so, of course, yeah. uh, so, uh, I get to speak. So, I'm really excited about being here. We got a lot of Ravens here. Uh, all the Ravens, stand up. Let's see them. We got a lot of Raven men back there. Nice job. Great having you here. Well, uh, Dan talked a little bit about how uh, I, I, I have a nor weird uh, path to the presidency at Benedictine College. So I went to Benedictine, I went to Washburn Law School, I graduate, uh, then I, I was a prosecutor down here in Johnson County for a while, then I worked in a, a small law firm for a short period of time, then I worked at Sprint, now T-Mobile, for 14 years. Uh, the last 12, I was on the board of directors of the college. And so uh, when my predecessor left, I went to the chair and I said, hey, uh, I don't have any experience for this job. You guys would be idiots to hire me. And they did. That was 19 years ago, and they haven't figured me out yet. So uh, I'm excited about being here. You know, when I had, uh, when they, uh, you know, I, I, when they asked me to do this, and this morning I was kind of getting uh, ready to go, and, you know, I'm, I'm anxious. I want to do a nice job. And, Whenever I get in that spot, I, I remember uh, I was asked to speak at a, a monthly uh, conference. I mean, it's a, it was a monthly dinner thing up in the Twin Cities, okay? And so they asked me to speak. It was great. And uh, they meet every month. And, and when I sat down, you know, the MC comes up and says, hey, uh, Steve, really nice job. You did a, did a great job. Uh, now listen up. Next month, we're going to have the best speaker that we've ever had at this event. So, uh, so. So next year, you'll have the best speaker that you've ever had, probably, uh, at this event. Um, I'm hope I really want to thank the organizers. Oh my gosh, this is the most well-organized uh, thing in the entire country, don't you? Thank, nice job, everybody. All you volunteers that are putting this together, really, really important. So I can't, uh, I really can't start a Catholic uh, conference without telling some. Lou Holtz stories, okay? You guys know who Lou Holtz is, former Notre Dame football coach, ESPN commentator, and he's become a real good friend of Benedictine College. And so a few years ago, uh, he, um, I was at some lunch, and I was talking to him about our commencement and everything like that, and he goes, well, gosh, Steve, I've given five commencement addresses in my life. They're the most rewarding experiences I've ever had. And I said, well, gosh, Coach, I'd love to have you have another rewarding experience at Benedictine College this May. And he says, well, you just ask. And you, you, you probably know he charges $25,000, $30,000 a speech. And he goes, you know, uh, I, don't, I, won't, I don't even charge for commencement addresses. And he goes, well, that's really good because we don't pay for commencement addresses. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, he, uh, he comes, uh, what, a, what a great experience. He lands, uh, comes on our campus, and he gets out of the car, and he goes, Steve, I've, I noticed that you want to build a grotto on your campus, and I want to be the first donor. 
He hands me a check. So, I mean, not only did he not charge, but he gave uh, money to us. And so then uh, on Monday after his commencement, I get a call from his assistant. And uh, I take the call and, and she, and I go, gosh, is everything okay? And she says, oh no, coach had a great experience at, at Benedictine. But he wants to know if you do him a favor. And I said, oh, I'd be glad to. And he says, well, next month, he's going to go to Rome, and he wants to know if you can get him in to see the Pope. I said, well, <laughs> not all that good of buddies with the Pope, okay, right? Uh, but anyway, of course, he had met Archbishop Nauman, so we call Archbishop Nauman. Uh, Archbishop writes him a letter, and lo and behold, uh, a month later, I see uh, a picture of him, you know, up on the stage with uh, getting a picture with the Pope, okay? Uh, and then a couple weeks after that, I get a letter in the mail uh, with another check for the grotto saying, hey, Steve, thanks for getting me in to see the Pope. Here's another check for your grotto. I said, okay, <laughs> right. So. Uh, but he, uh, 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 this is a men's conference, so I didn't invite my wife, but he always, uh, my favorite Lou Holtz quote is, um, and I do this whenever I introduce my wife, I, I say, you, uh, you know, behind every successful man is a surprised mother-in-law. And so <laughs> I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, can relate uh, to that, uh, that quote. So anyway. Uh, well, it's an honor, and uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what I think that can, that can cause success for you uh, in your life, in your family, uh, and in your business, and, and that is uh, uh, a couple things that we'll cover, but I, I can't do that without telling a little bit of history of Benedictine College, okay, because it all wraps in to uh, some of the pieces of advice that I'll give you today. So I, I always start with uh, explaining about Benedictine with the beginning. It started 1858, okay? So think about that, three years before the Civil War on the Kansas and Missouri border. Not a great place to start anything, you know your history, but the monks uh, had this vision uh, to bring education and faith to the prairie, and they did that. So you can imagine this is a school that was founded before Kansas was a state, Founded before we even had a bridge in Atchison, Kansas, and they started a college there. 80% of all the colleges and universities that were founded before the Civil War don't exist anymore, okay? So, so as you can imagine, lots of ups and downs in 165 years. Um, uh, they survived the Civil War and two world wars and the Great Depression, the civil unrest of the 60s, the financial burdens of the 70s and 80s. For you Catholics, this is really a significant time. You can imagine in about a 10-year period of time, our college and other Catholic institutions across the country went from having about 90% of your employees not being paid right there, monks and sisters working for free. And within about a 10 to 15 year period, you had 90% of your uh, faculty and staff being paid because, uh, be, uh, because of retirements and things like that. So that's pretty tough. Your whole financial model's turned upside down in, in 10 years. That's why a lot of them, a lot of them closed. A lot of them didn't make it, but, but we did. Okay, so you, you have lots of ups and downs in 165 years, but it's probably safe to say the last 15 uh, years have been incredibly, uh, uh, an incredible blessing for the college, okay? In the last 15 years, our enrollment has doubled. We've built 14 new residence hall buildings. Uh, we're building three more as we speak. We've built six new academic buildings, a new student recreation center, a new dining hall. We started new programs at the college, which are pretty unusual for small liberal arts colleges. Nursing, engineering, architecture are really great examples. Uh, we have some architecture majors in the audience here but, uh, and, and engineering uh, majors. I'm going to put this in perspective. Of all the, uh, there's 250 Catholic universities in America. America, there's only four that have both engineering and architecture. Catholic U, Detroit Mercy, Notre Dame, and Benedictine College. So it kind of shows our entrepreneurial spirit, okay? So all these things, U.S. News and World Report calls us, you know, we're a top 10 school in U.S. News and World Report. Cardinal Newman Society calls us one of America's best Catholic colleges. So people all the time come up to me and say, what's the secret? All across the country, you see these stories of enrollments decreasing, schools going backwards, and people will come up to me and say, what's going on? Why all this success and why now? And our answer is pretty simple. When people ask me that question, I say, there's two reasons for that success. Number one, we embraced our mother, and the second thing, we embraced our mission. 
So we embraced our mother. We consecrated the college to the Blessed Virgin Mary 10 years ago. We had a, a formal ceremony where we consecrated the college to her. We decided to put the entire college in her hands. In fact, at the consecration, we had 1,000 students circle the campus. They prayed a simultaneous rosary. We had, we had speakers set up all over the campus, prayed a simultaneous rosary. And when the rosary was done, we gave each one a Pope-blessed, miraculous medal that they then buried in the ground so her graces would surround the entire campus, okay? And it's been an unbelievable blessing to have consecrated the college to her. And as part of that consecration, we had many of our students, including all of our staff, consecrate ourselves to Our Lady. And it has been an incredible, incredible blessing. And so it's not just been the consecration. It's been other things that we have done to put the consecration into action, okay? So uh, I have to tell you how this, this idea came about. So I was invited to this Church in America Vatican Conference. Uh, in 2012, the meeting was in Rome, and in 2013, the meeting was in down in Mexico City, okay? And so I'm invited this. Only five Catholic university presidents out of 250 were invited to this. I have no idea why I was invited, but they, they invited me. So I go to Rome, okay? And I got to tell you this awesome story. So I go to Rome, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, living in this, uh, staying overnight, uh, in this hotel here. They call it Santa, Santa Marta. This is what they call I know there's a Santa Marta here in town, but they call it Santa Marta there in, uh, in the Vatican. And if you stay in the Santa Marta, you get this uh, gold key. And if you get the gold key, you can like literally go anywhere you want. You can go in all the doors. You're not supposed to in St. Peter's. But, but the coolest thing is that if you have the gold key, when you walk by one of the Swiss guards, they will click their heels and salute you. So... <laughs> I would walk by a Swiss guard, he'd salute me, I'd act like I forgot something, I'd walk past him again, he'd have to salute me. Uh, uh, you know, I, there's a, one opening where the Pope usually drives through and people are always taking pictures of it outside St. Peter's, so I didn't have to go through that exit, but I went through that exit, so people get pictures of the Swiss guard saluting me. Uh, and in fact, at, at the end, uh, I got home, you know, and I told Amy, I said, you know, I'm kind of getting used to this. I, I, I wouldn't mind if you would salute me, you know, every time I walk by. She said that she would salute me. Uh, I, uh, I thought it was probably going to be less, less respectful than the Swiss guard, so we, we don't do that. But anyway, so uh, while I'm at this conference, we, we decide to consecrate the college to Our Lady at that time. And the next year, we go down to, to uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and we go down to Mexico City. And, and so on the way there, I'm kind of reading up on Our Lady of Guadalupe. And there's one great quote that, uh, that is really powerful. You know, of course, Juan Diego is telling Our, Our Lady, he, you know, I'm not really worthy. Why are you picking me? And she says this. She goes, well, there are many I could send, but you're the one I've chosen for this task. There are many I could send, but you are the one I've chosen for this task. So I, I took that back to the college and I said, okay, how can we put this consecration into action? And so now what I do, anytime anybody applies to Benedictine College, and if they're accepted, I sign their acceptance letter. And when I get that letter, I say, I look at the name at the top of the letter, I say the name out loud, and as I sign my name, I pray a Hail Mary for that student so that, that Mary will intercede on their behalf and bring them to Benedictine College. So then when they uh, enroll and they come to Benedictine in August, I, I talk to them just like I'm talking to you, and, and I'll say this to them. I say, look, it, there are thousands of young people just like you all over the country. They're all sitting in chairs just like this. They're getting talked to by their president just like you are now. But in here at Benedictine College, Mary chose you to be here for the special task to be educated within a community of faith and scholarship. And I also tell them uh, that's why you can't read my handwriting, because I'm concentrating on that prayer, okay? And uh, uh, plus, plus it's in cursive, and that, uh, that generation can't read cursive anyway. So, um, all right, so this is just an example of how if you consecrate yourself, if you consecrate your family, if you consecrate your business to Our Lady, think about how you can put that consecration into action. 
how can you do this? You know, we had a formal ceremony. We buried uh, um, miraculous medals around our, our business. We, uh, you know, now I, I pray now for every student that comes to Benedict and I pray for every, I pray a Hail Mary at the beginning of every school year for every employee, faculty and staff at Benedictine College. Um, uh, you probably think, what does this guy do? Just sit around and pray Hail Marys all the time? But, you know, uh, so far the, uh, the, uh, the school's still surviving. So anyway, um, all right, so think about that. Think about this consecration, okay? That, that's helped with our success, consecrating ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The second thing that we did that causes this, our success is that we embraced our mission. We made a decision years ago that everything that we did, every decision we made was going to be consistent with that mission. In fact, we will be in cabinet meetings with the executive team every Wednesday. Before we make a decision, the last thing we ask ourselves is, is this consistent with our mission? Because if it's not, we're not going to do it. We have a monk that says, are you willing to go bankrupt for your beliefs? Are you willing to go bankrupt for your beliefs? And we kind of think of if your beliefs are true and the answer to that question is yes, that you'll never go bankrupt because your beliefs will carry on to success every time. I'm going to go over just briefly our mission because I want you to kind of get an idea of what this means, okay, and how this kind of impacts the life of a faculty, but, but how it could impact you. Because one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is that when you leave this conference or even at a, a downtime, you should ask yourself, What's my personal mission? What's my family mission? What's my business mission? Right? And you should write it down and then try to live that mission. It will create success in your life. There's no doubt about it. All right? So I always talk about our mission in pictures. It's just easier for uh, me to explain. But we, uh, the every mission should have a strong foundation, right? Uh, every athlete, every sports team, every business, our college, if you don't have a strong foundation, well, you're not going to be successful for very long. Our foundation we call the four pillars. We're a Catholic college, a Benedictine college, a liberal arts college, and a residential, okay? Catholic, Benedictine, liberal arts, residential. That's our foundation, our four pillars that supports our mission, which is to educate our students within a community of faith and scholarship. So this notion, and, and the reason I, I tell you this is because I just have, have the blessing to work at a place where the mission of the place I work is also my personal mission. Building community, having a strong faith life, and being uh, a, a lifelong learner. Okay, right? Community, faith, and scholarship. And so we tell our students all the time, hey, you're going to come and you're going to live the mission while you're here, not for us. We want them to live the mission because we want to live, live, to live the mission after they leave. And this is actually the mission that I, I, I guarantee almost every one of you live right now too. This notion of when you leave Benedict and you're an alum of ours, you'll have, understand the power of community. That the whole is stronger than its individual parts, right? Humans are social beings. We need each other to be fully alive, don't we? We probably know this better coming out of the pandemic than we've ever known it, haven't we? What, what society tell us? You can't build community. You can't build friendship. You can't have any relationships, right? You have to wear a mask all the time. You can't even get within six feet of people. And we missed something, didn't we, during that period of time? And we're just seeing the ramifications of those, of those rules uh, that uh, you have people that left the church, you have uh, young people that have mental health problems because of this isolation. Because why? Humans are social beings. We need each other to be fully alive. Building community was, is one of the most important things that you can do. So, leaving that you'll understand that power of community. Secondly, on the faith side, when you leave, that you'll have a close and personal relationship with Jesus Christ understanding that true happiness comes from doing God's will. So humans have this innate desire to worship. Each one of us have an innate desire to worship. And if we don't worship what's true, we'll end up worshiping other things. You see this, I, I hope not, but I, 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 I bet you, I, you see it in your own life, you see it in your friend's life, we see it in our students' life a lot, right? They, they end up worshiping other things, social media, 
video games, pornography, popularity, politics, all of a sudden that's all they can think about. And in, in essence, it becomes another God for them. And they end up worshiping something that's not true because we have an innate desire to worship. So when you leave Benedictine, you're going to have this foundation to love Jesus Christ and this foundation to, to worship what's true. And then finally, on the last, last part, you know, um, on scholarship part, when, when you leave, that you're going to be innately curious, that you're going to be a lifelong learner. Uh, humans have this desire for knowledge and understanding, okay? And so, and, and this is probably as important as it's ever been, right? I mean, we're kind of in this, we're getting, we're in this era where we're kind of, uh, our students are information rich, but analysis poor. I mean, our students, we're getting, everybody here is getting bombarded by tons of information every day, aren't we? Right? The question is, is can you analyze it, determine what's true, and use that information to make good decisions? Well, if they leave, and, and many of you here are lifelong learners yourself, and if you have a foundation in art, in literature, in history, in science, in math, in theology, in philosophy, well then all of a sudden, when you are bombarded by this information, now you can analyze it and make good decisions, okay? So community and faith and scholarship. If you can take those and, and instill them in your life, Okay, now that's the mission of Benedictine College. That's my own personal mission as well, and it's probably the mission of many of you in this room. But if you haven't set forth a personal mission or a family mission or, or an organization mission, then you should do that because living a mission is really important. Now, I agree and, and, and slightly disagree with Jim Collins. You guys have read Jim Collins, probably good to great, that book that he, he wrote a while back. And he said something kind of interesting. He says, listen, every organization to be successful has to create a mission and live that mission, okay? Now, he says it doesn't really matter what the mission is as long as you follow it. Now, I don't necessarily believe that. I think your mission needs to be true, okay, and, and, uh, and something that, that you can really believe in. But it's really important to have that mission and to live it. Okay. So community, faith, and scholarship. I am going uh, to, I, I want to talk just briefly about one of our pillars. Okay. I don't think I have to talk about the Catholic pillar because uh, we're living it here right now. And I just couldn't be more impressed with this, this group here. I want to talk about the Benedictine pillar. And I hate to do this in front of the Father Meinrad, who's an expert in this. Uh, in fact, he teaches Benedictine spirituality, but I'm sure he'll come up and correct me if I <laughs> don't do a good job. Uh, all right. So the Benedictines have been, are the oldest order in the church, right? 1,500 years old. Oldest order in the church and founded by St. Benedict. And it, he wrote this rule of St. Benedict. It's the oldest organizational constitution in the world, the rule of St. Benedict. And it's an incredible document. We have some in the back there at, break, uh, at the break. You can grab one for yourself. This is an unbelievable document. Chapter two of the rule is this unbelievable chapter on leadership. Take out uh, Abbott and put in CEO, and it's an unbelievable uh, chapter on leadership. Chapter 4, in fact, is so powerful. We have uh, one of our Benedictine sisters. She says she reads, during Lent, she reads a sentence a day out of chapter 4 and, and thinks about that, so it's so powerful. Now, i got to tell you, there's some pretty boring stuff in here. Okay, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what psalms you read in the middle of the night between Easter and Pentecost? Okay, not really exciting. Actually, my, uh, and, but there's some really kind of cool stuff. Chapter 22, uh, sleeping arrangements of the monks. Okay, St. Benedict says that you should sleep in your own bed. You should wear, uh, wear your habit to bed in case you get called out in the middle of the night, but not to wear your knife to bed because you may cut yourself. <laughs> we, we think that's wonderful advice, okay? Um, doesn't help us really run a college all that well. So what we did is um, we developed uh, our own, uh, the, not our own, but from the rule, we developed the Benedictine College values, okay? It's part of our mission. We have these values and these characteristics of a raven. And so it's been very, very important for us to create language, okay, that supports uh, the rule of St. Benedict. So we give these out to freshmen every year so then they can try to live up to these values and to these characteristics. And it's, it's really important. And you'll get, uh, you'll get one of these here. And this might be a nice guide for you. 
in your personal life, in your family life, in your business life as well, okay? Um, one of the things the Benedictines are really well known for is this, I call it this humility of hospitality, the humility of hospitality. St. Benedict writes in his rule that everyone, every guest, everyone should be greeted as if they're Jesus Christ himself. Should be greeted as if they're Jesus Christ himself. You know, you run a customer service department like that, you're going to be pretty good, don't you think? If you greet everyone as Christ. Now, I can't let this opportunity go by without telling my favorite hospitality story, okay? So I came 19 years ago, uh, and uh, we had this registrar. How can I say? She really hadn't embraced hospitality all that well, okay? <laughs> Apparently, one of our students went to ask her a question, and boy, I guess she just jumps all over him. She was just not very nice to him and kind of berates him a little bit. So I hear this, I hear this story, and I go to her the next day, and I said, I'm a little distressed about this, and I need to know, did you treat that student as if you're Jesus Christ himself? And she says, you know, Jesus never would ask a stupid question like that. <laughs> So, so this is why she's the former registrar, okay, and embraced uh, hospitality all that well. Uh, I, I leave that with you because I think it's really a great, uh, great thing to live, right? You know, I wish I could say I do it all the time. I, I wish I could say, but we tell our students, what a great aspiration. Treat others as Christ? Wow. Wow. I tell the students all the time, I say, look, if Jesus Christ was walking down the sidewalk, wouldn't you take your earbuds out and stop texting and have a conversation with him? Uh, yeah, but they, they never listen to me. But, uh, you know, we, I'm trying, okay? So, but anyway, okay, so Catholic, Benedict, and liberal arts residential, educating within a community of faith and scholarship. I tell you these two things because... Embracing your mother and embracing your mission and living that like that will create success for you in your personal life and your family life and your, and your work life, okay? All right, I'm going to leave, this, leave you with one last story. It's probably one of my, fa my favorite stories. So as a college president, um, as a college president, you have to, you know, one of our jobs is to raise money, okay? Um, and if anybody's interested, it's a B E N E D I C T I N E if you're writing your check. So, anyway, but we were gonna build this building on our campus. It was gonna be the largest building project on our campus to that point. It was gonna be really, really important uh, in, in our, uh, for the college. We go down to Texas, and I'm um, talking with one of our alums, and he says this He says, All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I love this project, and I want, to, I want to invest in this project. I will give you a million dollars. I'm going to write you a million-dollar check right now, okay, which is pretty awesome. I don't know if you've ever seen one. It's pretty neat. Uh, that plane ride home was very nervous for me, okay, with this million-dollar check. I'm going to uh, write you a million-dollar check now, and I'm going to give you a challenge. This was in February. He says, if you can raise an additional $6 million by June the 15th, I will give you another million dollars, okay, right? So he gives us a million, a challenge to raise six, and if we can do that by June the 15th, he'll give us another million dollars. Awesome. So we go out, we start talking to folks. I mean, it's been really unbelievable. You know, we never raised that much money in that short a time, but what a great challenge for us. So we do that. We're out there raising. But on June the 15th, that morning, I woke up, and we were still $600,000 away from meeting our goal, okay? Now, it just so happened that a former speaker of Men Under Construction and a uh, guy that you probably all well know, Mike Sweeney, was gonna come to our campus because we had a, uh, a leadership camp on our campus that day, June the 15th, okay? So he comes on to campus, I greet him, Mike, it's great having you here, thanks so much, and he says, hey, uh, Steve, you wanna come and hear my talk? I said, sure, Mike, I don't really have anything else to do. I just have to raise $600,000 by 5 o'clock tonight, but no, no big deal. Uh, so I say, sure, uh, and I'm sure glad I did, okay? Because he told this amazing story. He may have, may have told, you may have heard this already, but it's like an incredible story. I guess, you know, you may remember Sweeney. He was uh, in high school in California. He had this dream of being a major league ball player. He was getting recruited by Stanford and these other places to go to college to play baseball for them. But he decides he wants to get drafted out of high school because he had this dream of being a major league ball player. So he gets drafted out of high school, and he's drafted.
drafted as a catcher. So you remember that, right? So he's originally drafted as a catcher, and he goes and he's in the minors. And you know, catchers they kind of they kind of age faster than everybody else because they're behind the plate and things like that. And so. After about three or four or five years in the minors, finally the Royals organization said, Mike, look it, you have to make the big club coming out of spring training, okay, or, um, or we're going to release you. So what does Sweeney do? You know, this is an incentive. He does everything you're supposed to do to be a great ball player. He's, he's running, he's lifting weights, he's hitting off the tee, he's working as hard as he can to be a major league ball player, okay. But in the offseason, all the reports are terrible, right? The paper says Sweeney's going to get traded. Sweeney's going to get released. No way Sweeney makes the ball, you know, the big club coming out of spring training. And he's just so kind of like worried about this. He actually goes over to one of the coaches' houses and he says, okay, tell me, what's going to happen to me? And he says, Mike, I got to tell you, we literally just had a coaches' meeting yesterday you probably have about a 0% chance of being a royal coming out of spring training. So Sweeney's distraught, right? I mean, this is his dream. He for went college, everything, become a major league ball player, and now his dream's ending. And so, like Mike Sweeney, he goes to noon mass, okay, sits in the back row, and while mass is going on, literally crying the whole time. And one of his friends comes over to him after mass and says, Mike, what's wrong? So Mike tells him the whole story, and, she's, and so his friend says, Mike, listen, you have to think of your life as a tandem bicycle, you know, one of these two-seaters. Right now, you're on the front of that bike. You're pedaling as hard as you can, right, doing your weights and running and hitting off the tee, and you're guiding that bike to be a major league ball player. Mike, for you to be truly successful, you have to get on the back of the bike. You have to still pedal as hard as you can, but you have to get on the front and let God's will be done. Let God on the front. Let him guide you. And say, Jesus, I trust in you. And Sweeney says, you're, you're exactly right. I've been trying to guide this thing the whole time. Let my will be done. I need to let God on the front. Let his will be done. So he kind of proverbially lets God on the front of that tandem bike, and he gets on the back, and he still pedals as hard as he can, but he lets God on the front. And so what happens? So when he goes off to spring training, he hits 400, makes the Royals, five-time All-Star, and now in the Royals Hall of Fame. All because he was willing to get on the back of the bike and let God on the front and let his will be done. All right, so I hear this story. I'm pretty pumped, right? Okay, so I walk out, and I know exactly where I'm standing. I've got my phone in my hand, and I just look up to heaven because I've got this $600,000 to raise, okay, right, by 5 o'clock in the after afternoon, and it's, you know, uh, about 11 now, and I say, all right, God, look it. I'm going to get on the back of the bike. I'm going to pedal as hard as I can. I'm going to work as hard as I can, and if you want this to happen, I'm going to let you on the front. If you want this to happen, it will. And if it's not, I accept it. Literally, those words came out of my mouth, and my phone rings. It's from a guy from Colorado I hadn't talked to in six months. He says, hey, you know, I've just been thinking about this building, and uh, we're in for 200000 I hang up. I get another call from a guy who donates 100000 I hang up. I get another call. And this happened all the way to noon. And by noon, we had raised the $600,000, all because I was willing to get on the back of that bike and let God on the front and let his will be done. So that's pretty amazing. Okay, so three things I want to leave you with today. Uh, number one, uh, think about consecrating yourself to Our Lady. Think about consecrating your family and your business to Our Lady, putting the entire yourself, your family, and your organization in the hands of Our Lady. Great things will happen to you. Secondly, uh, if you don't have a personal mission or a family mission or an organization mission, think about doing that as soon as you can and living that mission, right? Embrace your mother and embrace your mission. And then finally, get on the back of the bike, Always work, you know, that old saying, pray, pray as if it, uh, work as if it all depends on you, pray as if it all depends on God. Get on the back of the bike, pedal, continue to pedal as hard as you can, but let God on the front and say to yourself, Jesus, I trust in you. 
Do those three things, and great things will happen to you. And uh, we've been really blessed. On the way out, I was going to tell you that we have, uh, we have gifts for you. So during the break, pick that up. I, uh, we were, I have a consecration booklet for you. And so if you've never done a consecration, here it is. This is Father Michael Gately's 33 Days Consecration Book. We, I have a, uh, this mission, vision, and values so you can get an idea about what we did and we made intentional language. And I also have a sticker for you of a tandem bicycle. So you can put it on your phone or your computer so you can always remember that story. God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here.